now I'm going to switch to English, and yeah, this is quite funny. I've never had like a, a s such good equipment uh, for such a small audience, so this is perfect. Uh, okay, and I'm going to start uh, with a sentence, which I'm sure. Uh, I'm going to start with a sentence, which I'm sure uh, that you have heard or seen many times. Uh, there is a gem for that, as an answer to uh, questions about uh, implementing certain features in Rails applications. Uh, and there is, a, there is a gem for that. Uh, and basically my response to this is no, uh, like a big scream, no. And this presentation is called Responsible Gem Collector, and I would like to tell you about picking the dependencies, the libraries for your projects, for your applications, and with the maintainability in mind. So let's say you would like to maintain your application for the next five years, and you want to know which gems should you use, which you shouldn't use. And my name is Adam. Uh, I run my own co company called Sunday Coding. Uh, I work primarily with Ruby and JavaScript. You can find me on Twitter. Uh, I also wrote a couple of blog posts. And recently I've launched my own product, uh, the code report for, for Ruby and Rails applications. So I encourage you to check this uh, all sites out. And this is a second sentence, uh, which is also commonly heard in the context of, of Rails that Rails is great for prototyping. And I agree with this, with this sentence, like truly. Uh, Rails is awesome when you want to build a prototype. Uh, but the honest truth for me is that I've never built a prototype. Uh, if you define a prototype as an application which, like at the beginning, you know that after two months, you are going to throw all of this code out and just like start from scratch, then you can call it a prototype. But my experience is different. Uh, my clients expect me to deliver some working application uh, quite fast, uh, like after a couple of months. Then they can validate the application, but they don't want to throw out any piece of code. They want this code to continue working, and they want to build on top of this code and add new features to, to the application. So. Uh, this, is, this is my experience with growing applications. And this talk is going to be all about examples. So I'm going to show uh, a lot of different patterns and anti-patterns from the code bases of different gems. And the important thing to, to understand is that sometimes I will show some bad practices, but all these bad practices are from the point of view uh, of the maintainability. So. Uh, I truly admire uh, all the gem maintainers which created the, the gems which I'm going to mention in the presentation. Uh, I'm just picking some, I'm just uh, showing some, some um, patterns and anti-patterns from the point of view of the long-term maintainability, but all of these gems are useful. And I'm going to start with the uh, Paranoia gem, and this gem is uh, for Ruby on Redis applications, and it uh, changes the behavior uh, of this when the records are destroyed. So instead of destroying records, you just hide them. And uh, so when you call client.destroy, it's not really destroyed. And you have to call client.really destroy to really destroy the record. And this is kind of weird because now the name of the method lies. So uh, the name of the method. Uh, the code inside the method performs a different thing which we are used to. So we are used to that uh, the destroy method from active record removes something from the database. By now, it's but now it's not the case. It it just hides it. So I believe this is an anti-pattern because uh, like every time a new developer joins our code base, we have to explain to him. He has to learn that. Okay, this is not uh, this is doing something different uh, than I expect it to do. And if we take a look at the code base of the of the gem and want to actually know how it achieves the result, it uses the uh, default scope uh, under the hood. So 
it adds a um, adds a like a default uh, which is applied when we query for for the records, and this causes a lot of problems. For instance, with uh, in associations, because uh, now when we have something which is associated with the with the destroyed record, uh, and we want uh, we we want to find it, it's not available. So we have to use some really crazy stuff like unscoped and basically remove this, remove this scope from the uh, from this uh, this default scope. And uh, also, if you think about that, uh, in many places in your application, you really want to display all of the records. Let's say an admin panel. Probably you want to display uh, like the records which are active. But also the records which are which are which were removed because the admin has to uh, have the like the view of, uh, of all the records in the system, also these deleted ones. So uh, we re in many places of our code base, we really want to uh, use uh, like all records, and we have to override this default. We have to get rid of this default. So if we have to, if we have a default which we uh, like commonly have to avoid, then I believe it's not a good, uh, good thing to do uh, when we have to fight with the default value. And let's move to the second gem, obfuscate ID, which is a gem for uh, slightly changing the identifiers of your of your records in the URLs. So when you have a user with ID three. It's not so obvious that it's a user with ID three because it's mapped to uh, two millions uh, six thousand thirty five, for instance. Uh, because probably uh, you don't want to reveal uh, to your investors the information that you have only like ten users in your system. You want to claim that you have many of them. Uh, so this gem is very easy to integrate. You just have to uh, add this obfuscate ID call to your record class, and basically you are done. Uh, but now let's check how it works under the hood. So in order to achieve this result, this gem overrides the find method from active record. So it prepends its own behavior to the find method. It changes the, the it changes the the find method from active record, and Override in, when we override methods from our libraries in our library, we introduce like a coupling between our library and this other library, because whenever the uh, API of this find method from from active record changes, then probably this code uh, breaks. So we have to wait for the maintainers of this obfuscate ID gem to fix. To release a new version before we can update our uh, before we can update active record to the newest version, so probably we are not able to update rails to the newest version so this is also something to watch out for and the gem, which is kind of similar in the in the behavior and probably more popular is friendly i d and this introduces a concept of Slacks, uh, like friendly identifiers in the URL, and it allows you to uh, search for uh, for records by means of these uh, of these friendly identifiers rather than just numeric values. And in the previous versions, they used to do things like uh, like that. So they used to just override the find method uh, globally, but then they noticed this this problem and they switched. Mm, to overriding the find method only on the friendly scope. So you have to use the scope friendly to uh, and to get this additional additional behavior. And this is much better uh, because you localize just uh, encapsulated the place where where the changes are applied. And the additional benefit is that uh, you are able to quickly find all the places in your code base uh, where you use this behavior because you can just search for the friendly uh, string in your code base and you have all the points when you use this this behavior so this is a benefit and let's take a look 
into the, the code base and, and, and check how the Slack is generated. So in order to generate the Slack for a record, they add a callback before validation, which sets the, which sets the Slack. And I believe this is not a good thing because um, when, we use, when we use callbacks, we lose the control uh, over the code. So now the generation of the Slack is performed under the hood. We have no control when it happens. And probably we want to do that only in some specific circumstances, maybe for some subset of records. Maybe uh, we want to do that uh, n not as a part of the model code. Maybe we want to extract it to, I don't know, some service object or some use case or like whatever outside of, the, mm, of this model layer. But we cannot. It's just done for us as a as a before validation callback. So this is when we use callbacks, we use we lose the control over uh, over our system. Okay. And uh, next example, which uh, deals with kind of similar problem, like a technical problem. Uh, but a totally different domain is GeoCoder, and GeoCoder is for it's a gem for translating uh, the address in terms of uh, in expressed as like a street number uh, and the country, um, just as a string, to a set of geo coordinates like latitude and longitude. And well, what they do is they provide the geocode method uh, on the on the model level. Uh, but and they ask you in the readme to add this uh, after validation callback so it's performed uh, automatically but the good thing is that it's only in the in the documentation it's not part of the gem code so you can just avoid doing this you can skip this part and you, you can call this geocode method on your own whenever you want uh, from like whatever place you you would like this to, to happen. You can do this from a service object. Maybe you can do this asynchronously from a background job. Uh, you have more control uh, when this geocoding is performed. OK, uh, let's switch to uh, another example, which involves callbacks, uh, and talk about uh, integration between Ruby or Ruby and Rails applications and um, Elasticsearch which is a full text search engine. So here we have like two approaches, uh, the easy approach and the simple approach. So let's start with the, uh, let's start with the um, easy approach, uh, which is provided by Elasticsearch model gem. And this case is like really wonderful for me as a, as a comparison because here uh, the maintainer has released two different gems uh, the different patterns of integration. So this is an like, awesome opportunity to, to compare these two. So the first one is Elasticsearch model. And we just have to include two modules into our, um, outer, uh, to our model class. And uh, we get these callbacks, which automatically sync our uh, changes in the database to Elasticsearch. We also get uh, a class level import method which performs the import to Elasticsearch for all the records in the database. And we get this um, Elasticsearch uh, query DSL on the level of the, of, the, of the class. So we can search for some records uh, calling the methods directly on the, on the class. And uh, this approach has a couple of limitations. Basically, uh, Storing something in Elasticsearch is an HTTP request, so it takes some time. And when it's performed by, uh, via callbacks, then uh, it just stops our application when this request to, to Elasticsearch is performed. So probably we would like to do that in a background job, or maybe we would like to do that only for the uh, articles which are which are published, or because we don't do that, we want we don't want to do that for drafts. So we would like to have more control uh, over when this uh, persisting to Elasticsearch uh, has to happen. And if we decide to use this easy approach, which is easy to add but difficult to extend later on, uh, we rely on callbacks, so we lose the control. 
And the simple approach is provided by Elasticsearch Persistent Gem, in which uh, we define our own repository class. We include the module uh, from Elasticsearch Persistent, and we define the serialized and deserialized methods. So the serialized method takes our database record and translates this record to an Elasticsearch document. And the serialized method performs uh, like the opposite uh, operation, so it takes Elasticsearch document and translates to our uh, database record. And the good thing about this is that we now can manually instantiate this repository in whatever place we want and just call save on it and pass the record which we want to, uh, which we want to store in Elasticsearch. So we have full control when this process happens. And the added benefit is that this also this uh, repository class is also a place where we can define uh, some methods uh, which express uh, what we want to achieve in terms of our business domain l language. So like find by title and encapsulate this uh, Elasticsearch uh, query language inside this repository, so the abstraction does not leak outside this, this repository. Uh, and so now, the full text search behavior in our application is separate from other things, and especially from the database. And it may happen that uh, we want to have a different mapping between database record and Elasticsearch document and one-to-one -one mapping. For instance, maybe we want to take like three records from our database and combine the data from them and store them as one document in Elasticsearch. So now we, have, we like, totally can do that. Okay. Uh, and let's change the topic again. And uh, paperclip versus carrier wave, which are like two approaches for uh, storing attachments in Ruby on Rails applications. So I'm not going to tell you which uh, of these two gems is, is better because this has been like a long fight in the in the community, and probably still not decide. Like, uh, there are. Uh, people who claim that paperclip is better, there are people who claim that carrier wave is better and doesn't make sense to, to decide. Uh, but I want to focus on one particular approach, which is where the code responsible for attachment is stored. So uh, when we use paperclip, uh, we start with this has attach file call in the, in the uh, model class. Uh, but as we add more and more options and configuration, uh, we have uh, like this, our uh, user record becomes uh, bloated because we have like a lot of code which is related only to to the attachments, but it's still stored in the in the user class. Uh, and in carrier wave, they followed a slightly different path. So here we define uh, a separate class for that, which is av uh, avatar uploader, for instance. Uh, we inherit from from carrier wave uploader base to get this uh, all this behavior, uh, but now this cl uh, this class encapsulates all the code which is related to to handling attachments. So we have a one place for handling attachments, and it's not our model class, uh, which is kind of cool because uh, models in in Ruby on Rails uh, like already have uh, too many responsibilities. If you think about that. Just by inheriting from Active Record Base, you get the behavior uh, like the uh, object relational uh, mapping. You get the typecasting. Uh, you get the uh, code related to validations and associations. So it's like a, a lot of responsibilities just by inheriting from Active Record Base. So if we keep adding more and more code to our model classes, then it's just uh, becomes unmaintainable unma because it has too many responsibilities. There's too much code related to different concepts in the in the model class. So whenever we can, it's good to extract this code to some separate concepts, like this uploader. And let's talk for a while uh, about the next gem, which also uh, requires us to put a lot of code to to the model uh, to the model class. So the state machines gem for defining a, uh, a 
the state machine, which is a mechanism for handling state transitions uh, and firing some code when the state changes or permitting or not permitting state transitions. Uh, and here in, with the state machines uh, gem, uh, we define uh, we define uh, some states. We define the initial state. We define uh, what methods are are called when the state changes and all stuff like that. And the problem with this approach is that all of the, all this code is placed inside the inside the model class. So um, again, we put all our business logic in the in the model class, and this model class becomes bloated. Uh, and what is more we kind of uh, use this gem to define our business logic. Uh, and the business logic is the most important part of our application. And if we just uh, give our business logic to some particular gem, then we are limited by the API of this gem. So we can do like only what, what is possible with this gem. And probably we don't want to limit ourselves uh, when it comes to, to our business uh, domain logic. We would like to have like a full control over it. So we use our own classes uh, and uh, define our own structures, our own concepts for, for handling the business logic. Uh, so giving up your, your business logic to a gem is not a very good idea. Uh, okay, and I would like to talk now about the Pandit gem which is uh, a gem for authorization in Ruby on Rails uh, applications. And it has the basic concept in Pandit is a policy. So if you have a post model, you define a post um, policy and you have to pass the um, user and the post to the uh, initializer. And then you define methods uh, which return true or false. Uh, and this method should correspond to some actions which are performed uh, on this resource. Uh, and the amazing thing here is that there is no trace of Pandit in, in this piece of code. So there is no reference to Pandit. This is just a convention which Pandit enforces, but it enforces it in its readme. So they just ask you to structure your code like this, but you don't have to include Pandit, you don't have to inherit from Pandit. And in the in the controller, you call authorize and pass the pass the model. So then it takes the current user, it take uh, to, to and pass to, to pass it to the policy. It also uses the uh, po the name of the model. So the post appends policy gets post policy to to construct uh, the appropriate policy, and it knows which method to call on this because. Uh, it takes the name of the action and appends the question mark to the end, so it knows what which method to call. But we can be more explicit here, so we can manually specify which uh, method we want to call and override override this behavior. So if we have like a, a bunch of actions which should be handled in the same way, we can override it. And what is uh, also good is that we can override the policy in the model class. So we can say that uh, this post should use a different policy. And we can also do that on, on the class level and the instance level. So probably we can use a different policy depending on the state of the, of the post if we want to do that. And if we want to use this pandit gem outside of the controller or view context, we can still do that and just call the policy and bank uh, method on the on the pandit uh, module, so mm, we can use uh, you can s we can still have authorization uh, in our mm, service object layer or maybe in a background job or like wherever we want to to have this. We we are not limited, and the amazing thing is that we can even do it like that. So here we just don't use Pandit at all. You, we like migrated off Pandit uh, gradually. Uh, this uh, post policy has nothing in common with, with Pandit. It just uh, follows the structure defined by Pandit, 
but it's just plain old Ruby object. We can do whatever we want with this object. So we can manually instantiate uh, this object and just use this policy however, like in whatever uh, way we want. And I believe this is a really good idea because we are not tied to this gem at any point in our development process. Uh, okay, and, uh, and then for the uh, as the next topic and the, the the last topic in the presentation, I would like to discuss which groups of gems are like generally safe. Uh, and the first group are API wrappers. I believe they are. Uh, safe in most of the of the cases, and example can be Stripe uh, Gem, which is uh, just an app API wrapper for the Stripe API for handling uh, for handling payments. So the Stripe exposes REST API, and you could implement this uh, this connection, this inter uh, this interaction with Stripe on your own, but it doesn't it just doesn't make sense. Because uh, this gem is maintained by the authors of the uh, of the service, and it encapsulates uh, like boring stuff like authorization or error handling uh, for you, and it also maps the resources from uh, from Stripe API to Ruby classes, which is n nice to to work on. It's better to to work on classes than than some like nested hashes, and uh, so I believe this uh, in, in it's safe to use an API wrapper, uh, and it's also safe to use uh, adapters for external services, which can be like databases. It can be uh, the full text search engine, can be uh, message queue, and the example here is Bunny Gem, which is uh, a, uh, API, uh, which is a, a connector to. Uh, RabbitMQ message queue, so it wraps all the concepts mm, from RabbitMQ, uh, like connection. It wraps the, the the channel, the exchange, and all that stuff. Uh, and again, you could do that. It's not it's not a problem. The the specification is open, but it's not the core of your business domain, like. Probably you just want to publish a message to to a message queue. You don't want to you don't want to handle all this underlining complexity, uh, which is involved in the communication with with RabbitMQ. Uh, so you just use this you use this gem. And the third group is, I can say, uh, like in general, not the core of your business. So everything which is not uh, related to the core of your business domain. And the example can be the spreadsheet gem, uh, which allows to manipulate Excel files. So uh, like write new Excel files, uh, give them the name, uh, put some values into the into the the, the rows columns. Mm, and again, probably uh, in your application, uh, dealing with spreadsheets, it's not the it's not the part of your business domain. You just want to export some data and create a spreadsheet file, uh, but it's not very important uh, for you. You just want to have this encapsulated and handled by someone else. And the important thing here is that in all these three examples, uh, this is you who uh, calls the gem. Nothing is happening under the hood. You explicitly call Stripe, you explicitly uh, call Bunny, and you explicitly call the spreadsheet gem whenever you want to use this. So a quick uh, summary. Uh, don't delegate uh, your business logic to gems. Uh, if you decide to express your business logic, uh, like some transitions of the state, in terms of a bunch of, of gems, then you are limited by the capabilities of, of these gems. Uh, so it's good to introduce your own concepts and invoke the library code explicitly. So uh, when you can call the uh, gem code explicitly, just invoke it, uh, then in most cases you are safe. But when you plug your code to the gem to be run uh, like as a callback 
or as some event which and you have no control when it's going to be called, then uh, this may introduce maintenance problems. And the third advice is to take a peek under under the hood. If you consider using a, using a gem, uh, just think for a while uh, how it may be implemented. So what mechanism may be uh, may be used to to give your these features. And I don't encourage you to read like all the source code, but just uh, sometimes it's very easy to to spot uh, this this mm, place this pattern which which is used like in case of this um, paranoia uh, paranoia gem. And then you may decide whether I want to introduce a dependency into my code base which is using something which I believe is an anti-pattern. Uh, so thank you. And yeah, do you have any questions? So basically, when we're speaking about, for example, paranoia, yeah, um, it's easy to spot that something's wrong there because there's like definite scope set on the model and so on. But in terms of larger gems that we are using, what are like the most common things that we should look for when we are looking at the book? So uh, yeah, the second example was this callbacks, which are kind of easy to to spot, and uh, yeah, <laughs> probably these two are the most troublesome patterns. And in general, uh, I would say that uh, the lack of the tests of or spec directory uh, in the in the gem repository is like a big warning. Because if it has like n basically when you use mm, when you just uh, decide whether to use some gem or not, you have to ask yourself uh, a question uh, like w whether uh, will I be able to maintain this gem on my own, and uh, or whether I will be able to re-implement this functionality on my own. So if the, uh, the code base is like very short and like 60 lines of code and you understand these lines of code, then probably you can use this gem because even if it becomes unmaintained, you can take the ownership of this gem. And if the, mm, if the code base is huge, it's good to look for, for tests because if there are tests, uh, maybe you or maybe some other company uh, may take the maintenance of, of the gem, but if there are no tests for, for the gem, it's probably not going to happen. Cool. So, thanks. <laughs>